Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. My email is sriklpm at gmail.com. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Rajamandri, Andhra Pradesh, India. Today we are going to talk about a very very interesting and fascinating topic, Cognitive Neurology Part 9, Agnosia and Apraxia. Cognitive Neurology Part 9, Agnosia and Apraxia. So what is Agnosia and what is Apraxia? Agnosia, Apraxia and awesome concepts. Gnosis, knowledge, refers to the highest synthesis of sensory impulses with the resulting perception, appreciation and recognition of stimuli. Agnosia refers to the loss or impairment of the ability to know or recognize the meaning or import of a sensory stimulus even though it has been perceived. Agnosias are usually specific or a given sensory modality for a given sensory modality and can occur with any type of sensory stimulus. For example, visual agnosia. The vision is intact but still they are not able to appreciate or understand what they see. That is visual agnosia. So the peripheral part is intact but the sensory processing area namely the occipital lobe gets affected. Auditory agnosia example, the auditory apparatus is still in, is intact but still they are not able to understand spoken words. That means that there is a processing uh, being <coughs> affected in the temporal lobe. So this, are, this is agnosia, visual agnosia or auditory agnosia. So agnosia refers to the loss or impairment of the ability to know or recognize the meaning or import of a sensory stimulus even though it has been perceived. Example, vision is perceived by eye, but still they cannot make any sense of the uh, objects they see. The words are perceived by the auditory apparatus, but still they are not able to make any sense of the words they hear. So, agnosia refers to the loss of the ability of the or impairment of the ability to know or recognize the meaning or import of a sensory stimulus, even though it has been perceived. So what are the various types of agnosia? I just give two examples, but there are many types of agnosia. One is the tactile agnosia, inability to recognize stimuli by feel despite the intact primary sensory modalities. Visual agnosia, loss or impairment of the ability to recognize things visually despite intact vision. Color agnosia, the patient cannot name or identify colors although the patient is not color blind. Auditory agnosia, inability to know or recognize sounds by audition. Prosopagnosia, inability to recognize familiar faces and may immediately identify the person by sound of the voice. Autotopagnosia, loss or impairment of the ability to name and recognize body parts. Simultagnosia, ability to perceive only one object at a time or specific details but not a picture in its entirety. Example, they miss the forest for the tree. Finger agnosia, loss or impairment of the ability to recognize, name or select individual fingers of the patient's own hands or the hands of the examiner. Phonagnosia, loss or recognition of familiar voices. Time agnosia, loss of time sense without disorientation in other spheres. Visuospatial agnosia, loss or impairment in the ability to judge direction, distance and motion and the inability to understand the three-dimensional spatial relationships. Anasognosia, it refers to a patient's lack of awareness of a neurological deficit. Multimodal agnosia, inability to assimilate sensory information from more than one domain. Now let's see uh, specific agnosias. A stereognosis or stereoanesthesia. It is the loss of the ability to recognize and identify an object by touch despite intact primary sensory modalities. The primary sensory modalities are intact 
but still the person is not able to identify an object by touch. Stereoglossis is tested by asking the patient to identify with eyes closed common object placed into the hands, example coin. The most convincing deficit is when the patient is able to identify with the other hand an object that she was unable to identify with the tested hand. So when you ask the person to close his eyes and keep a coin and ask him to identify it by the touch, he will not be able to identify it. But take the object, take the example coin and put it in the other hand if he is able to identify it, that it confirms that the person has got a stereognosis or stereo anesthesia. When primary sensory modalities in the hand are impaired as by radiculopathy or neuropathy, failure to identify an object by touch is not a stereognosis because primary sensory modalities itself are impaired. A stereognosis usually indicates a lesion involving the contralateral parietal lobe. So it's a cortical function. Tactile The patient is unable to identify the object with either hand but can identify it visually. Graphisthesia. The inability to identify or recognize the numbers, numbers written on the patient's palms or fingertips. In the presence of uh, intact primary sensory modalities, it usually indicates a lesion involving the contralateral parietal lobe. So if we ask, if we put a number, example 6 or 7 on a person's hand, and ask him to identify the number, he will not be able to identify it. This is known as graphesthesia. Despite the primary sensations being intact, it indicates a lesion of the contralateral parietal lobe. Finger agnosia. It refers to the loss or impairment, to the loss of impairment of the ability to recognize, name or select individual fingers of the patient's own hands or the hands of the examiner. Testing for finger agnosia may be conveniently combined with the assessment of the right-left disorientation. The simplest test of right-left disorientation is to ask the patient to raise a specific hand, example right hand or left hand. Finger agnosia and right-left disorientation along with agraphia and acalculia make up the just man syndrome. The lesion is likely to be in the dominant inferior parietal lobule particularly in the region of the angular gyrus. Visual agnosia, psychic blindness. Patients can see but cannot make any sense of the visual world. In the visual agnosia, there is a loss or impairment of the ability to recognize things visually despite intact vision. Area 18 and 19 are particularly important for visual gnostic functions for the interpretation of the visual objects. Types of visual agnosia. Lisher divided the visual agnosias into two types. One is the apperceptive agnosia, second is the associative visual agnosia. Apperceptive visual agnosia. The patient may be able to see parts but not the whole object and the object becomes unrecognizable, asymmetric agnosia and the lesion is in the parietal regions. For example, if there is lesion, the parietal occipital lesion, they develop asymmetric tenognosia. If they are asked to see the forest and see the forest in its entirety, they will not see the forest in its entirety. They will be only looking at a particular tree. They will miss the forest for the tree. So, a patient may be able to see parts but not the whole object and the object is unrecognizable and the lesion is in the parietal occipital regions. This is known as aperceptive visual agnosia. Then we have another visual agnosia which is known as associative visual agnosias. It refers to a global inability to identify objects in the absence of visual impairment, aphasia or anomia. Patients can really can readily identify the same objects using other sensory modalities. The lesion being in the occipitotemporal junction often involving fusiform gyrus. Example prosopagnosia. So here they cannot make what of the visual information. They cannot identify an object by vision. For example, they cannot identify a human face as a, a human face. They cannot uh, say which particular person's face it belongs to. But the, the person by vision, but if the person is talks or uh, the, the way he, he walks, 
uh, or other modalities then the person is able to appreciate but by vision he is not able to appreciate uh, this is known as prosopagnosia inability to identify known face by vision but if the person starts talking he may be able to identify so by other senses he may be able to identify so it refers to a global inability to identify objects in the absence of visual impairment aphasia or anomia patient can readily identify the same object using other sensory modalities the lesion in the bilateral occipital temporal junction often involving fusiform gyrus example prosopagnosia visual object agnosia the patient is unable to identify familiar objects presented visually and cannot correctly identify a seen object from a pick list visual object agnosia must be distinguished from anomia the patient with anomia cannot recognize the object when presented by another modality example touch the anomic patient may also be able to demonstrate what the object is by gesture example appropriately applying a comb to her hair yet not be able to call it a comb whereas the patient with agnosia does not recognize the comb as a comb and has no idea what to do with it Simultagnosia it is the ability to perceive only one object at a time or specific details but not a picture in its entirety they may be able to read letter by letter but not recognize in the entire entire word for example simultagnosia they may say s i m u l t a g n o s i a but then they cannot identify and and read the word in its entirety area 19 is thought to be important in revisualization and lesions in this region cause a loss of visual memory an object can be identified when seen but the patient cannot describe it afterward now this is all about agnosia now let's talk about another important topic a fascinating topic apraxia praxis means action so apraxia means action gets affected it is the inability to carry out on request a motor act in the absence of weakness sensory loss or other deficit involving the affected part the patient must have intact comprehension and be cooperative and attentive to the task idiomotor apraxia and ideational apraxia are seen with a dominant left parietofrontal lesions whereas constructional apraxia and dressing apraxia which are more to do with the spatial orientation are seen with the non dominant right parietal lesions idiomotor apraxia the patient may be able to carry out an act on command or initiation such as showing how to use a comb but be able to use the actual object the patient may be unable to carry out an act or command or initiation such as showing how to use a comb but be able to use the actual object so a person if you ask him to comb the hair mimic how he comb the hair he cannot but if you give a real object like comb he can comb his hair so in indio border apraxia there may be a disconnection between the language or visual centers that understand the command and the motor task and the motor area task with actually carrying it out since the patient can perform an act with the actual object there is no limitation of activities of daily living only when a person is asked to imagine and then do he is not able to do it but if given a real object he is able to perform so when he is asked to imagine how he combs his hair he cannot but when you give a real comb he is able to comb the hair this is because of a disconnection and since the person is able to carry out with the real object activities of daily living are not impaired whereas in ideational apraxia the patient may be able to carry out individual components of a complex motor act but cannot perform entire sequence properly there is an inability to correctly sequence a series of acts leading to a goal in daily life patients with ideational apraxia may perform tasks out of sequence example brush teeth before applying toothpaste they may brush teeth and then they may apply the toothpaste so they go out of sequence they cannot perform a uh, goal directed sequence properly the sequence is lost they can do it in bits and pieces but not in a sequence so activities are of daily living are impaired in patients suffering from ideational apraxia because if they are given a brush and ask them to brush their teeth they may take the brush and start brushing the teeth and then take it out and then put the paste so they are not able to do 
activities of daily living in a proper way. So activities of daily living are impaired in ideational apraxia. Sympathetic apraxia. It is the inability of a patient to perform complex motor act with a non paretic limb in the presence of a unilateral dominant hemispheric lesion. For instance, a patient with left hemispheric lesion causing Broca's aphasia may be unable to show how to wave goodbye using the left hand. This is because the fibers connecting the language areas of the left hemisphere with the motor areas of the left, right hemisphere are disrupted. The patient understands the request but has no weakness of the left hand but is unable to execute because the right hemisphere never receives the command in the first place. Yeah, these are all the interesting and fascinating concepts of agnosia and apraxia, the awesome concepts. I've enjoyed uh, giving this lecture and I hope you have also enjoyed listening to my lecture. If you have any suggestions or comments, kindly post on to my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts or connect me on my email cklpm at gmail.com. I'm also the author of the, medic of the book Focused Neurology. The neurology concepts have been put in a question and answer format and available online, especially Amazon. If you are interested, you can buy it online. But please like and subscribe my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.